so please let me know in the chat box uh, if everything is okay so that we can directly uh, move to the session so hello kishore uh, ashish tripathi kishore all of your messaging fine so thank you so much uh, for your confirmation i hope that uh, both my audio and video is all fine so once again welcome to this uh, fmg accelerate uh, dermatology session by pw meded so uh, i'm having two days of dermatology session so what we will do here is uh, we would be going to uh, hey, one minute so we will be going to have uh, a two day session so uh, today we'll be discussing almost around let us say around 20 to 25 mcqs and tomorrow also we'll be doing the almost the same okay so with your permission uh, so let me just uh, get it started so ramanand lakshman medpsycho all of you very good afternoon so with your permission let's begin with the first question so i hope that by this time we have gone through almost all the important topics right so let us uh, consider that this will be some kind of a revision session as well so let us see this first uh, question that is exclamation mark sign is seen in which of the following conditions now exclamation mark sign do you remember like where have you heard about it exclamation mark sign so the options are alopecia areata tinea capitis trichotillomania and androgenic alopecia so now let us see what is this exclamation mark sign so from all these four options we get to know that this is something related to the hair am i right so it is something related to the hair so med psycho is saying that it is going to be alopecia areata how many of you are agreeing with med psycho or is there any other answer that you would like to share so here the right answer would be alopecia areata raj rana is also answering now what is alopecia areata this alopecia areata as you must have learned it is an autoimmune disease right so it is a auto immune disease now what are the three hair findings in alopecia areata the hair findings in alopecia areata you can remember it as p e t now what is p e t now p stands for what is a type of hair loss it is going to be a patchy hair loss right it is not a generalized hair loss instead it is going to be a patchy hair loss so this is one of the hair findings that is patchy hair loss what is e e is going to be exclamation mark sign like what is being asked in this mcq that is exclamation mark sign and who can answer what is t any guesses for t like what is a hair finding that starts with t in alopecia areata so very good going prakash is saying that it is a non scarring alopecia completely agree with you in alopecia areata you get a non scarring alopecia excellent prakash so what is this t t stands for turning gray phenomenon a okay, turning gray phenomenon so these are the findings that you see in alopecia areata that is seen in the hair fine that is seen in the hair now quickly let me ask you what is the nail finding that you can expect in alopecia areata so anybody who can answer what is the nail finding nail finding in alopecia areata yes the nail finding these are going to be multiple depressions over the nails now what do you call for these depressions over the nails these depressions over the nails are called as nail pitting isn't it so you will be able to see a pitting over the nails so you can see a regular and shallow pitting over the nails you can see a regular and shallow pitting over the nails so very good med psycho is also answering it correct and finally let us talk about the treatment of alopecia areata so just imagine that you have got a patient who got a patchy hair loss and is complaining to you and now what is the treatment of choice now is there any injection or is there anything that we can give within the lesion that is is there any injections which can be given intra lesionally in alopecia areata so what is the right answer so yes the right answer here would be anyone i'll just give you a small uh, time to you know make a guess 
so it is always good to have an interactive session so let's make a guess what is the intralesional drug that we use for the management of alopecia areata so yes intralesional triamcinolone can be used intralesional triamcinolone can be used for the management so that is all about alopecia areata so in this question the right answer would be alopecia areata where you can see a exclamation mark here so i hope that this is all okay for you now let me go to the next one now a patient presents with the below skin lesion in which there is no mucosal involvement now which of the following organism will be the most probable cause now now let us see what is the image now in this image what you see is that there is a lesion in which there is some erosion isn't it there is some redness and what would be the diagnosis in all these type of cases so here the diagnosis can be an impetigo right a superficial bacterial infection of the skin so when you see something like this which can be a superficial bacterial infection called impetigo so we know that there are two types of impetigo what are the two types of impetigo we have either a non bullous impetigo or a bullous impetigo so these are the two types of impetigo that is present that is a non bullous type or a bullous type whereas what is the causative organism in this type of impetigo the causative organism when it comes to non bullous impetigo the most common ones would be streptococcus streptococcus more than staph aureus isn't it whereas when it comes to a bullous impetigo what is the most common organism the bullous impetigo is most commonly caused by staph aureus is you most commonly caused by staph aureus so now we know that if the diagnosis is impetigo which is a superficial bacterial infection of the skin then there are two likely causative organisms these are streptococcus or it can be staphylococcus now what are these are these bacilli or cocci are these gram positive or gram negative now let us just go back raj rana is answering that it is gram positive cocci now let's see the options gram positive cocci gram negative cocci gram positive bacilli and gram negative bacilli so what is the right answer here it is going to be gram positive cocci because both streptococcus as well as staph aureus they both are gram positive and they both are a cocci so prakash kumar is also answering excellent so that is about this question now let's go to the next one a lady with bilateral buccal involvement having a lacy white pattern which is not been able to be scraped by a spatula pain increases on intake of spicy food no history of tobacco chewing but having a history of dental amalgam on the third molar teeth the most likely diagnosis now what do you think is the diagnosis here <clears throat> the options are lichen planus erythroplakia leukoplakia and candida now let us try to analyze like what are the most important key points when it comes to this mcq so there are multiple things that may make you deviated from the may correct answer so now let us see what are the key points the main key point here is the lacy white pattern that you see within the oral mucosa this white lacy reticulate pattern that you see within the oral mucosa in which there is a pain which increases on consumption of spicy food so in which disease did you learn about such a clinical scenario yes such a clinical scenario is seen in lichen planus so you do you remember yes very good med psycho so that is the an correct answer is lichen planus the reason why is because in lichen planus we know that the patient is going to present with what is the color of the rash is it a red color rash or a violaceous rash yes so the patient may be presenting to you with a purple colored or a violaceous rash and is this rash itchy or not yes this is very severely pruritic so this is going to be a pruritic rash so purple colored pruritic rash can be seen in lichen planus along with that we have learned about something called as a wickham's striae isn't it this is called as a wickham's striae so this wickham's striae is called as the 
वाइट लेसी रेटिक्यूलेट पैटर्न दैट यू कैन सी ओवर द स्किन और विद इन दरल म्यूकोसा now do you think that this oral involvement in lichen plan in lichen planus is it a pre cancerous skin condition or not or is it a pre malignant condition what do you think now why is oral lichen planus important oral lichen planus is important because this is pre malignant to squamous cell carcinoma because this is going to be pre malignant to squamous cell carcinoma so here the right answer is going to be uh lichen planus now in this case why did they mention that this is a lesion which cannot be scraped by a spatula now which of these lesions can actually be uh, taken away like a membrane so among all these options is there any such lesions which can be scraped with a spoon or a spatula so so that can be scraped off yes that is seen in oral thrush or candidiasis isn't it that is seen in oral thrush or candidiasis but that does not happen in the case of lichen planus that does not happen in the case of lichen planus so i was just wondering like when when we when we discuss about lichen planus how about the most com most characteristic nail finding the what is the most characteristic nail finding in lichen planus so do you remember what is it yes bhavna sharma very good you have answered it as candida which which can be scraped off now i'm asking you what is the nail finding the most characteristic nail finding when it comes to lichen planus who can answer yes so the most characteristic nail finding would be pterygium of the nails pterygium of the nails so in which there is a wing shaped extension of the nails this is called as a pterygium of the nails this is the most characteristic finding so very good rajrana it is the most characteristic finding it is the most characteristic finding that you see in lichen planus so can anybody tell me what is the most common infection that is associated with lichen planus what is the most common infection associated with lichen planus how about this question so is it a, a streptococcal sore throat or is it epstein barr virus or is it human herpes virus or is it hepatitis c what is the right answer the most common infection that is associated with lichen planus yes the right answer here would be hepatitis c so hepatitis c is the most common infection that may be associated with lichen planus very good so as you have mentioned in the chat box onico like uh, onico lysis yes all these there are multiple nail findings that can be seen in uh, lichen planus especially like the thinning of the nails 20 nails dystrophy all these things can be seen pup tenting of the nails is one of the finding but here the right answer the most characteristic one would be pterygium so very good raj is again answering at hepatitis c so now let's move to the next question so in this next question an old man with a deep pigmented vertical patch on the lower jaw neck and sternum without crossing midline the rest of the physical examination is normal which of the following is the most likely diagnosis so what is the answer here so there is a old man and he has a deep pigmented patch deep pigmented patch so a patch means it is a lesion which in which there is no elevation no depression patch means there is only a change in color and what is the change in color it is a deep pigmented patch here now this is present over the lower jaw over the neck over the sternum however there is no crossing of the midline which means this is a lesion that is present only towards one side of the body now what is the most likely diagnosis now the options are segmental vitiligo acrofacial vitiligo pybaldism albinism so what is the right answer medpsycho is saying it is segmental vitiligo do all of you agree yes so this is going to be a segmental vitiligo now what is segmental vitiligo why does the lesions in segmental vitiligo it does not cross the midline what is the reason the reason is that 
in segmental vitiligo the lesions are present along a dermatome so the lesions are present along a dermatome that is the reason why these lesions are not going to cross the midline is there any other disease that comes to your mind when we talk about a dermatomal distribution so when we speak about dermatomal distribution have you learned about any other disease your answer in the chat box please so what is the other disease where we have seen there is a lesion that is not crossing the midline or runs along a dermatome so do you remember herpes zoster the reactivation of varicella virus in that case also in herpes zoster the lesions do not cross the midline because this is again going to be along a dermatomal distribution so this is called as segmental vitiligo now what is the second option that is acrofacial vitiligo how do you identify acrofacial vitiligo acral means extremities correct so if there is a vitiligo lesions over the extremities and the face then you can call it as a acrofacial vitiligo now what is happening with piebaldism who can answer what is piebaldism so this one called as piebaldism so what is piebaldism so in piebaldism what happens is that this is a autosomal dominant inheritance isn't it now what are the features in piebaldism in piebaldism you can see vitiligo like patches you can see vitiligo like patches along with that you can also see a whitish discoloration of the frontal hair it's called as a whitish forelock whitish forelock so whitish forelock with vitiligo like patches over the skin with the autosomal dominant inheritance this is called as piebaldism this is called as piebaldism and the last one is albinism how about the inheritance pattern of albinism now that we said that piebaldism is autosomal dominant can you tell me what is the uh, inheritance pattern in albinism like oculo cutaneous albinism is there oculo uh, albinism all these things what is the inheritance pattern yes this inheritance pattern is going to be autosomal recessive so this is going to be autosomal recessive in nature whereas piebaldism is going to be autosomal dominant what about vitiligo is vitiligo uh, having some inheritance pattern or is it something else vitiligo in this mcq we have talked about vitiligo right so vitiligo just like alopecia areata this is going to be a autoimmune disease this is going to be a auto immune disease okay very good so all of you are answering in the chat box excellent so keep going so this is good now let's move to the next question so a five year old uh sorry uh, one lady developed a painless beefy red genital ulcer with swelling in the inguinal area on biopsy a safety pin appearance was noted which of the following is the most probable diagnosis for this lady so there is a lady with a genital ulcer so this is a genital ulcer disease that is being asked now there is a peculiarity of this ulcer which is mentioned in this mcq that this is a painless ulcer and it is beefy red in color fine you have enough clues now there is one more clue right now that is it has a safety pin appearance it has a safety pin appearance so what is the right answer options are granuloma inguinal lymphogranuloma venerum uh, syphilis and chancroid so some of you are answering it as c some of you are answering it as a now is it a or is it c now let's try to understand every time you get an mcq about genital ulcer disease always try to remember that a painless genital ulcer a painless genital ulcer if it is mentioned in the mcq always try to remember there are three cases which you can remember it as lsd okay what is lsd lsd imagine that it's a drug so if it is a drug you will not get to know the pain so l stands for lgv s stands for syphilis and d stands for donovanosis 
okay, donovanosis. Now, based on this mnemonic, we know that just coming back to this MCQ, this is a painless ulcer. So, only three options LGV, syphilis, donovanosis. So, LGV, syphilis, donovanosis. So, this one, chancroid, is already ruled out. Now, which is that ulcer which has a beefy red in color, beefy red in color and bleeds to touch and bleeds to touch. So, this one is a peculiar mention about a typical ulcer that you see in donovanosis. This is seen in donovanosis. So, that is seen in donovanosis, beefy red in color and bleeds to touch. But now when we check this MCQ, we cannot see donovanosis in the uh, options, right? Instead, you can see granuloma inguinale, which is the other name of donovanosis. So previously, we used to call it as granuloma inguinale as well. Okay, this is the older name. Okay, this is the older name of donovanosis. So here the right answer is donovanosis. Yes, chancroid is going to be painful. So med psycho, can you also answer me in which is that other genital ulcer which is going to be painful? So one of the ulcer you said it is chancroid. One more disease, one more genital ulcer disease which is going to be painful ulcer, painful ulcer. One is chancroid. What about the next one? One more, who can answer? So one more ulcer is going to be herpes genitalis, okay, herpes genitalis which is the most common cause of genital ulcer disease, herpes genitalis. So is that clear? So with your permission, I will just move to the next question now. So the next question is, a farmer comes to the skin OPD with a painful swollen foot which has a discharging sinus and dark grains coming out of these sinuses. Which of the following is the most probable diagnosis? So, when you read this question itself, I'm sure that the answer should come to your mind, right? So, this is a classical triad which has been mentioned in this MCQ, in this question. So, what is it? There is a farmer who presents with a painful swelling of the foot. There is multiple discharging sinus and grains coming out of the sinus. So what is the diagnosis? Here the diagnosis is pretty much clear. This is called as Madura foot or mycetoma or mycetoma. So this is Madura foot or mycetoma where what is the, what are the components of this triad? The components of this triad is going to be a tumor like swelling of the foot. There is a tumor like swelling of the foot, isn't it? So there are going to be multiple discharging sinuses. Multiple discharging sinus is present. And what comes out of this uh, sinus? What comes out of the sinus is macroscopic grains discharged out of the sinus. Macroscopic grains are going to be discharged. See mentioned as macroscopic which means which is visible with the naked eyes, isn't it? So this is a typical triad of mycetoma or madura foot. So here the right answer is going to be madura foot. Now, can you tell me is Madura foot a purely a fungal disease or can it be bacterial? So, always try to remember that this condition called as mycetoma in case if it is caused by a fungus, what do you call it as? In case it is caused by a fungus, what do you call it as? Yes, fungus means true which means you. It is you mycetoma. It is you mycetoma. Whereas in case the biopsy or the histopathology when it comes back as positive for a bacteria, then what do you call it as? If it is positive for a bacteria, you call it as actinomycetoma. Actinomycetoma. So it can be either a fungal disease or it can be a bacterial disease. So fungal means eumycetoma and 
bacterial means actinomycetoma yes sulfur granules can also be seen sometimes so based on the typical color of the granules also we can make out some of the diagnosis as well okay sometimes it is going to be black in color sometimes it is going to be yellow in color if there is a sulfur content and all fine so i hope it is clear to all of you so now let's move to the next question so in this next question a patient came with complaints of diarrhea dermatitis and mental retardation so it was also found that he was a maize eater what is the probable diagnosis of this patient a very easy question right it is a very easy question and a very often repeated question in fmg exam very often repeated and all there is no recent exam in which this question was not asked okay so the easy scoring question for you what is the right answer is it beriberi is it night blindness it is pellagra or is it kwashiorkor yes so all of you are able to answer this this is called as pellagra now what is happening in pellagra what is the deficiency that is seen in pellagra so rajrana medpsycho fahim ashrafi rahman bhavna all of you are right excellent good going so now what is the deficiency yes so there is a deficiency of niacin in the case of pellagra isn't it there is a deficiency of niacin or tryptophan deficiency whatever now what is happening here is now what are the very important skin finding for example on the day of exam if you get an image where a patient is having a photosensitive rash over the neck area <coughs> which looks like a necklace now what is it called as what are the um, skin findings that you see in pellagra yes this is called as a necklace what is the name this is called as kessel's necklace so this is called as kessel's necklace so this is one of a very important finding that you can see in pellagra okay now what about there is one more finding like if the patient is going to present to you with a shiny rash over the dorsum of the hands like the hands are going to look like a red in color now there is a name for this sign as well what is this sign called as so this sign anyone good metpsycho kessel's necklace now what about this sign there is a shiny red rash that you can see over the hands especially over the dorsum of the hands so this is called as gauntlet sign okay this is also called as gauntlet sign so these are two very important uh, skin findings that you can see in pellagra okay, these are seen in pellagra so now let's move to the next one <coughs> so all are seen in this condition except so you have been given a very vague image where you cannot make out what is the exact diagnosis isn't it you can see that there is a hyperpigmented uh, plaque lesions multiple in nature that is seen in the image so based on this image you may not be able to reach out the right diagnosis now let us see the options first mundros microapsis wickham strie sort tooth acanthosis civetti bodies now all are seen in this condition except which means three of these things are going to be seen in one disease am i right so what are those three things that is seen in one disease wickham strie sort tooth acanthosis and civetti bodies all these three are going to be seen in a single disease what is the name of the disease anyone so the name of the disease here is this is all together seen in lichen planus so all these three are seen in lichen planus so the odd one out is going to be mundros microapsis okay the odd one out is going to be mundros microapsis so please remember for your day of your exam always try to describe the lesion that is given in the image in case the image is not very clear or you are not able to make out the diagnosis then especially in these type of questions where you get all are seen except which means three of the options are going to be seen in the one disease correct so in that way you please try to make out the correct answer now this one mundros microapsis fahim ansari is saying mundros microapsis now tell me where do you find this mundros abscess in which disease do you find mundros microapsis hmm? no no problem don't be confused no no issues at all we can learn it very peacefully 
fine my psycho don't worry so mundros micro abscess is seen in a disease condition called psoriasis isn't it this is seen in psoriasis now what is this mundros micro abscess mundros micro abscess is an example of a neutrophilic micro abscess it is an example of a neutrophilic micro abscess so in this disease condition called psoriasis there is one more neutrophilic micro abscess that can be seen which means there is a collection of neutrophils that you see in the histopathology in uh, psoriasis what is the name of the other neutrophilic micro abscess the name of the other neutrophilic micro abscess would anybody would like to give it a try in the chat box here the right answer would be Kogoch spongy form pustules. So these are the two examples of neutrophilic microabscess which you can see in this disease called psoriasis, Mundros microabscess and Kogoch spongy form pustules. Okay and remember Wickham striae, sawtooth acanthosis and CVT bodies all these things are seen in lichen planus. All are seen in lichen planus. Very good, Rajarana. Excellent. So now let's move to the next one. Which of the following is a side effect of 13 cis retinoic acid? Now, this was a twister, isn't it? So here they have given you the chemical name of 13 cis retinoic acid. What is this 13 cis uh, retinoin, retinoic acid? Very good, Fahim Ansari was also answering earlier. So I was just seeing the chat right now. So what is this 13 cis retinoic acid? Yes, this is also called as the isotretinoin, isn't it? This is also called as isotretinoin. So this is also called as isotretinoin. So where is isotretinoin usually used? Usually isotretinoin, this is the drug of choice in severe acne. In severe acne. Okay, whenever the patient is going to have a very severe acne like the nodulocystic acne. Like the nodulocystic acne. We can use this medication called as isotretinoin which is also called as a 13 cis retinoic acid. Now, what is the most dreaded side effect of this drug? So, which among the following? Is it teratogenic? Is it neural tube defects? Follicular hyperkeratosis? Photoanycolysis? What is the right answer? Yes, we all are afraid of this teratogenic feature of isotretinoin. That is the reason why we should not prescribe this to expecting mothers or uh, lactating women okay so this is actually contraindicated and then in case we are going to treat any female patient with isotretinoin we have to uh, advise the patient about proper contraception isn't it we have to always ask the patient to have proper contraceptive measures as well to make sure that the patient does not conceive now what is the teratogenicity period what is the terato genicity period of isotretinoin options are two weeks four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks okay the right answer here would be yes it is contraindicated so here the teratogenicity period is going to be one month the teratogenicity period is going to be one month now what is the most common what is the most common side effect of isotretinoin can anybody answer this question like what is the most common side effect of isotretinoin yes the most common side effect is going to be dryness of the lips dryness of the lips so very good rajarana is answering it as four weeks so in between there are also questions like do we have a date for the upcoming fmg yeah, unfortunately no isn't it so anyways let us have our uh, preparations going on fine so medpsycho is answering it as dryness of the lips excellent you are also right that that is the most common side effect of isotretinoin so what are the other side effects of isotretinoin because there is a huge list right the other side effects the other side effects of isotretinoin if you remember depression can be one depression is one of the side effects uh, night blindness is one of the side effects night blindness 
also dyslipidemia the patient can have deranged cholesterol profiles isn't it so dyslipidemia is also one of the side effects of isotretinoin so all these are the various side effects of isotretinoin so now let's move to the next one so in this question a patient presented with a hypopigmented macules over the back and the upper trunk over the back and upper trunk on koh mount spaghetti and meatball appearance was seen what can be the causative agent in this patient so do you know this answer and now a very typical image is also given so in this typical image what do you see that a patient is going to have you can see i am just zooming out this image for you so what do you see in this image you can see that there is a hypopigmented patches isn't it over the trunk so here uh, fahim metsaiko bhavna all of you are answering it as malassezia furfur so pk is also answering excellent the correct answer is going to be malassezia furfur now please tell me what is the diagnosis here what is the diagnosis this is a fungal infection which is also called as hmm, pteriasis versicolor this is a fungal infection which is called as pteriasis versicolor this is also called as tinea versicolor it is also called as tinea versicolor and this is a infection that is caused by a commensal yeast which is present in all of us and this commensal yeast is also called as malassezia furfur it is sometimes also caused by malassezia globosa as well isn't it now what is a very important koh finding here the very important koh finding that you can see in pteriasis versicolor is spaghetti and meatball appearance this is also compared to a banana and meat and banana and grapes appearance in the koh banana and grapes appearance in the koh so all these can be seen in pteriasis versi color now what is the drug of choice in these kind of cases what is the drug of choice so this can be azole group of drugs azole group of drugs can be used like ketoconazole etc fine so that is the right answer here moving to the next one so a patient presented with lesions as shown in the image later the patient also developed arthritis what is the treatment now if we should answer about the treatment first we should know what is the diagnosis isn't it so what is the diagnosis here so this patient presented with lesions as shown in the image so just just see this image it's a very typical image where the patient is going to have a uh, erythematous plaques so all these are erythematous plaque lesions and there is a very typical scaling as well silvery white scales so where do you find erythematous plaques with silvery white scales yes this is seen in psoriasis this is seen in psoriasis now what happens here in psoriasis is that this patient usually may present with a erythematous plaque with silvery white scaling silvery white scaling so no worries if you make a mistake right now no worries at all so please remember that what happens in urticaria in urticaria there is no plaque lesion there is some edema beneath the skin like there is some water beneath the skin surface fine so that is going to be an entirely different presentation now here what you can see is there is some redness over the skin there is a raised lesion and there is this whitish scales so that is a typical presentation of psoriasis that is a typical presentation of psoriasis now there is a patient of psoriasis and he is also developing arthritis means there is psoriasis plus psoriatic arthritis what is the drug of choice or what is the treatment so is it rituximab is it mycophenolate cyclophosphamide or methotrexate what is the right answer here the right answer would be methotrexate methotrexate so please don't make it wrong so please make a note of it that the drug of choice in psoriasis overall 
is going to be methotrexate it is going to be methotrexate so remember any psoriasis like in the on the day of exam if you are getting a question like a patient with psoriasis along with pitting of the nails what is the treatment methotrexate if a patient is having psoriasis along with low backache let us say psoriatic arthritis what is the treatment methotrexate if there is a patient who is complaining of some uh, involvement of the scalp as well psoriatic uh, scalp involvement drug of choice methotrexate so the overall drug of choice in psoriasis is going to be methotrexate now there are few more things that you should remember when it comes to the treatment part in psoriasis like what is the drug of choice in psoriasis in setting of a liver disease for example if there is a chronic alcoholic who is having a psoriasis in such cases will you prescribe methotrexate obviously no because of the side effects hepatotoxicity right so what is the drug of choice in such cases in such cases we can go for cyclosporine in such cases we can go for cyclosporine so whenever there is a setting of a liver disease like in a chronic alcoholic the drug of choice can be cyclosporine now what is the drug of choice in generalized pustular psoriasis so what is the drug of choice in generalized pustular psoriasis now in this case when there is pustules instead of a plaque lesion in such cases the drug of choice is going to be acetretin acetretin so i hope this thing is clear to all of you uh, the treatment part of psoriasis is very important that is the reason why i have been emphasizing on all these points so please remember overall in psoriasis it is going to be methotrexate whereas when it comes to a liver disease always go for cyclosporine whereas in the case of pustular psoriasis the drug of choice is going to be acetretin it is going to be acetretin so now let's move to the next one identify the plant that is shown in the image below now we are talking about dermatology but all of a sudden we are talking about a plant to identify the plant now why is this significant in dermatology so is it parthenium is it ginkgo biloba is it poison ivy or vita trifolia what is the right answer so here the right answer is going to be parthenium hysterophorus isn't it so what is the name it is going to be parthenium hysterophorus now what is this parthenium hysterophorus very good all of you are answering it right raj med psycho rahil pk rajrana all of you are right so this is also called as a congress grass or congress weed whatever you call it as so this is something that grows freely anywhere isn't it now why is this significant in uh, dermatology is because this is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis fine this is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis we can also say that this is the most common cause of phytodermatitis phyto means plant so phytodermatitis so parthenium hysterophorus or the congress weed is going to be the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis as well as the most common cause of phytodermatitis fine that is all about this one now do you know what is i just would like to ask you like what is the most common cause of irritant contact dermatitis what do you think is the most common cause of irritant contact dermatitis anyone in the chat box please because there are two types of contact dermatitis if you remember one is allergic contact dermatitis and the other one is irritant contact dermatitis so in irritant contact dermatitis what is the most common cause it is usually seen in housewives housewives eczema so what is the causative this is going to be detergents so detergents are going to be the most common cause of irritant contact dermatitis and this is seen in housewives eczema housewives eczema fine very good so now let's move to the next one auspitz sign is seen in which condition 
where you see a auspit sign. So auspit sign is something that you must have learned in. Is it pemphigus? Is it psoriasis vulgaris? Is it pustula psoriasis? Or is it an acne vulgaris? Where did you learn about auspit sign? I'll tell you what is auspit sign. Like if you take a glass slide and in case there is a plaque lesion, if you start scraping over this plaque lesion, so if you continue the scraping, what will happen is you can see multiple pinpointed bleeding spots. This is called as auspit sign. Now where do you sign? Where, where do you see it? All of you are answering it as B. Psoriasis vulgaris. Excellent. So Medpsycho, Rahil, Sulkas, Rajarana, all of you are answering it as B. Psoriasis vulgaris. So that is right. So in psoriasis vulgaris, what you can see is scraping over the lesion. Will produce pinpointed bleeding spots. So this is called as auspit sign. This is called as auspit sign, which is seen in psoriasis. Which is seen in psoriasis. Fine. So is there any sign that can be seen in pemphigus vulgaris? So I ju I'm just curious to know that is there any dermatological sign? which you can see in pemphigus vulgaris like let, let me tell you that uh, there is a patient who has come to you with a vesiculobullous lesion and then you just try to apply some tangential pressure over the normal skin and what happened was that the bulla has also peeled off now what is this sign that i'm mentioning here right now that is another sign you can see in pemphigus vulgaris Medpsycho is answering it right very good this is called as the Nikolsky sign this is called as the Nikolsky sign excellent fine so Nikolsky sign seen in pemphigus vulgaris auspit sign is seen in psoriasis vulgaris next one ulcer with overhanging or undermined edges in the neck region as shown in the image yeah, PK was also giving the right answer. Very good, all of you. So now in this question, what is the most probable diagnosis? Tubercular lymph node, malignant cervical lymphadenopathy, syphilis and reactive lymphadenopathy. Yeah, so in this question, they have not given you any clinical history. They just gave you that there is a patient who is having an ulcer over this neck region. Isn't it with undermined edges or with overhanging edges? So in such cases, especially in the context of Indian uh, patients, then one of the most common uh, diagnosis that should come to your mind is the tubercular lymph node. It's a tubercular lymph node. So uh, Rajarana, don't go for uh, answer B because for answer B, it can be a possibility in case they would have mentioned some hint about a malignancy elsewhere. Isn't it? So because the lesions are uh, pretty big, but there is no mention of any malignancy. So the most probable answer here would be a tubercular lymph node in the Indian patient setting. Fine. So moving to the next one, which of the following mineral deficiencies can lead to this condition? So options are zinc, iron, calcium, vitamin A. So which of the following mineral deficiencies can lead to this condition? So what is being seen here? Hmm? Now, first of all, can anybody tell me what is the diagnosis here? So there is a small baby and you can see that there is multiple erosive lesions that is present over the peri orificial area of the face. So yeah, all of you are answering it as A very good all of you so this is an example of a deficiency of zinc so what do you call for deficiency of zinc so monica fahim medpsycho rahil all of you answering pk okay ashrafi rahman so here the diagnosis is going to be acrodermatitis acrodermatitis enteropathica it is acrodermatitis enteropathica. So what is happening in acrodermatitis enteropathica? There is going to be a zinc deficiency. There is going to be a zinc deficiency. Now what are the clinical features of acrodermatitis enteropathica? You can remember it as a mnemonic DAD. -D, okay, what is D? 
D stands for diarrhea. Okay, D stands for diarrhea, which means the patient would be having a complaint of loose stools or diarrhea. A stands for alopecia. A stands for alopecia. And D stands for dermatitis. And D stands for dermatitis. Now, what is the type of dermatitis that you can see? You can see a periorificial dermatitis. You can see a periorificial dermatitis when it comes to acrodermatitis enteropathica. So, very good. All of you are able to answer. So, diarrhea, alopecia and dermatitis. These are the three cardinal features and always remember it is periorificial and that is the reason why in this image you can see that the lesions are present outside the nasal cavity. It is seen around the mouth. So, airy around the orifice. So, periorificial dermatitis is seen in acrodermatitis enteropathica. Very good. So now let's move to the next one. What is the first line of treatment for acne comedones? What is the first line of treatment for acne comedones? Options are topical steroids, topical antibiotics, benzyl peroxide and topical retinoids. So here the question is about acne comedones. Acne comedones. What is your right answer? Is it A, B, C or D? All of you in the chat box, please. So, Medpsycho Rahil, all of you are saying it as topical retinoids, and that is the right answer. Monica is also answering. So, it is topical retinoids. Now, why is it topical retinoids? When it comes to the treatment part of acne vulgaris, always try to remember this that what happens is uh, there are various type of lesion that you can see, isn't it, in acne vulgaris. For example, in acne vulgaris, I hope that all of you agree that the patient can present to you with comedones. It can be either a closed comedon or an open comedon, isn't it? So the patient can also present to you with a papular lesion or a pustular acne. Papular lesion or a pustular acne. In all these conditions, our first line of agent or the drug of choice is going to be topical retinoids it is going to be topical retinoids can somebody tell me what are the examples of topical retinoids what are the examples of topical retinoids anyone so one of the examples is going to be adapalene the other example is going to be tretinoin tretinoin so, adapalene and tretinoin are going to be the examples of topical retinoids which is going to be the drug of choice in comedonal acne, in papular acne, in pustular acne. But now my next question is what is the drug of choice in severe acne? We have discussed it few minutes back like what is the drug of choice in severe acne. Very good Monica. So, this is going to be isotretinoin. So this is going to be isotretinoin. So that is going to be the drug of choice in severe acne. So by severe acne, I mean a nodulocystic acne. By severe acne, I mean a nodulocystic acne. So now let's move to the next question. So identify the condition that is being shown in the image below. Identify the condition that is shown. Options are malignant melanoma, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma or a nevus or a nevus. So what is the right answer here? Who can answer? So I'll just zoom out this image for you. So you can see that there is a very large lesion. The borders are not properly defined. There are multiple colors in the lesion. For example, in the center, it is going to be dark. The outer area is lighter. So this part is lighter. So what is the diagnosis that comes to your mind when you see this kind of a lesion? So some of you are saying A, some of you are saying B. So now let's see whether it is A or B or C. Fine. 
So, so remember that whenever you see any black colored lesion, always think about a mole, okay, nevus, okay, there would be a proliferation of a nevus. Now, what is happening here is, in the case of malignant melanoma, we have to always evaluate any kind of a mole with a A, B, C, D, E algorithm. Now, what is this A, B, C, D, E algorithm when it comes to a mole? So, what is A? A stands for asymmetry. Okay. The lesion would not be symmetrical. B. B stands for border irregularity. Border irregularity. And C stands for color variation. Color variation. And D stands for diameter more than 6 mm. And E means it is going to be evolving. Okay, that is evolving in size, color and shape. Size, color and shape. So this is the A, B, C, D, E algorithm that you have to make sure that you are using this algorithm whenever you see a atypical mole. Fine, atypical mole. So some patient who is having this blackish discoloration over the face, then immediately what you have to do is you have to evaluate it with ABCD algorithm. You can see that this lesion is asymmetric. There is no clear cut borders. You can see that there are multiple colors in the lesion. You can see that the size is quite big, more than 6 mm. So this is going to be a malignant melanoma. This is going to be a malignant melanoma. Whereas, why the answer is not basal cell carcinoma? Because in basal cell carcinoma, we usually get a lesion which is going to have a rolled out border and in the center, you will be having telangiectasia. Okay, there is some telangiectasia in the center. That is how usually a patient will present to you with a basal cell carcinoma. Okay, so here the right answer is going to be malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma. So now let's move to the next one. Like which of the following organisms is responsible for causing erysipelas? So what is an erysipela? So what are we talking about? Yes, Rajrana, you can see a rolled up border ulcer. Yes, when it comes to basal cell carcinoma, what is the name of that basal cell carcinoma which will destroy the tissue underneath? Mm -hmm. So, you just made me remember one more point here. So, what is the name of BCC that destroys the tissue underneath? So, this is called as rodent ulcer isn't it this is called as rodent ulcer this is called as rodent ulcer fine that is the name of the basal cell carcinoma which can destroy the tissue underneath so now let's move to this uh, question which we was discussing so most of you have answered it as a streptococcus and that is the right answer as well so please remember this condition called erysipelas is exclusively caused by streptococcus. So this is going to be ex exclusively caused by streptococcus. Fine. Now what is erysipelas? What happens is that usually uh, according to the site of the lesion, let us say that the most superficial bacterial infection of the skin is an impetigo. Isn't it? And then if more layers are involved, it can be called as an ectima. And even if the subcutaneous tissue is going to be involved, then we can call it as a erysipelas or cellulitis. Fine. So when it comes to erysipelas, the most common or the exclusive causative organism is going to be streptococcus. Is going to be streptococcus. Fine. That is about erysipelas. Now let's move to the next one. Identify the condition that is shown in the image below. Now the, this is again a image based question. So you can see that there is 
sun exposure area see metsycho erysipelas is not seen in any sun exposed areas so remember that erysipelas is a bacterial infection of the skin erysipelas is a bacterial infection of the skin where the epidermis plus dermis plus superficial subcutaneous tissue is also involved plus superficial subcutaneous tissue is also involved so the patient may presents with complaints of a red and tender skin with well defined borders with well defined borders so this is going to be the usual presentation when it comes to erysipelas so this is going to be the usual presentation when it comes to erysipelas now moving to the next question most of you have answered it as a a a all of you are answering it as condyloma acuminata very good so since you can see a rough surface warty kind of a lesion we can call it as a condyloma acuminata so this condyloma acuminata condyloma acuminata is going to have a rough surface lesion and what is the causative organism of uh, condyloma acuminata the causative of condyloma acuminata what is the causative yes this is caused by human papilloma virus and which is a subtype of the human papilloma virus which can cause condyloma acuminata is it 2 and 4 is it 6 and 11 is it 13 and 17 so what is it yes so this is going to be 6 and 11 so the 6 and 11 is it a high risk subtype or a low risk subtype so 6 and 11 is going to be very good rajrana med psycho so all of you are answering it right this is a low risk subtype which means it is not going to cause any kind of a malignancy isn't it because there is some case where human papilloma virus is associated with a malignancy like cervical carcinoma isn't it so, but in this case when it comes to condyloma acuminata these are going to be a low risk subtype that is 16 and 11 now tell me that instead of this rough surfaced lesions like what you can see here if you find a flat topped lesions if you can find a flat topped lesions in genitalia what would have been your answer flat top lesion in the genitalia what would have been your answer at that time the answer if it is a flat top lesion it is not going to be condyloma acuminata instead the answer would have been condyloma lata condyloma lata so in which disease do we find these kind of a flat top lesions over the genitals that is condyloma lata is seen in which disease so condyloma lata is seen in secondary syphilis it is seen in secondary syphilis very good so yes raj rana med psycho all of your answering so that is seen in secondary syphilis so that is about condyloma acuminata now what about the treatment of choice in condyloma acuminata treatment of choice in condyloma acuminata who can answer the treatment of choice in condyloma acuminata is going to be either imiquimod or podophyllins so this is the treatment of choice when it comes to genital warts or condyloma acuminata okay imiquimod or podophyllins but can we use this imiquimod or podophyllins in pregnancy answer is no the reason is because this is going to be teratogenic so if the question is in pregnancy what is going to be the treatment of genital warts we are not going to use imiquimod or because this is going to be teratogenic so for pregnancy may what is the answer 
so med psycho is having a question mark after cryotherapy so is it cryotherapy yes absolutely right this is going to be cryotherapy very good so here the answer is going to be cryotherapy excellent so now let's move to the next one <clears throat> The common complication that is associated with the following condition given in the image below. Now, what can you see in this image? Options are post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome that is 4S, encephalitis, pneumonitis. So, what is the right answer here? So Raj says uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Anyone else who can answer? Bhavna also says that it is option A. Yes. So here, what is the diagnosis here? This is a very typical image that can be asked. So this is going to be impetigo contagiosum. So this is called as impetigo contagiosum or the non-bullous type of impetigo or the non-bullous type of impetigo. So a few slides ago we had discussed about the two types of impetigo. One is non-bullous, the other one is bullous. So what is the causative organism of non-bullous impetigo? Non-bullous impetigo is caused by streptococcus more than staph aureus. Do you remember? It is caused by streptococcus more than staph aureus. So whenever there is a case of a streptococcal infection which has been not treated properly, it can go into a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Isn't it? Now what is the name of the typical crusting that you can see in non-bullous type of impetigo? What is the type of crust? So Medpsycho has already answered it in the chat box. So what is the type of crusting? The type of crusting that you can see is a golden yellow honey colored crust. Honey colored crust. So golden yellow honey colored crust is seen in a non bullous type of an impetigo. Fine. Now whereas in case this, this question was the same but the patient was having large bullous lesions. So in case it is a bullous impetigo, what would have been the answer given the same options? Bullous impetigo is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus, correct? So in case the Staphylococcus aureus is not treated properly, it can lead to Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, fine? So please make sure that you have this concepts very clear. Non-bullous impetigo means post streptococcal glomerulonephritis whereas bullous impetigo means the complication can be staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome moving to the next one a patient presents with a history of a severe sunburn only after a few minutes of exposure in the sun that means there is a very severe photosensitivity there is freckling in the sun exposed areas, dry skin and changes in the skin pigmentation. What is the diagnosis? So options are seroderma pigmentosum, incontinentia pigmenti, warts and melanocytic nevus. And melanocytic nevus. So what is the right answer here? Rahil says A. PK says A, Rajrana, I think all of you are going for the same option, that is A. So, Bhavna is also Vishnu, Vishnu, Andy, all of you are going for A. Excellent, very good. Now, why is seroderma pigmentosum the right answer? Because in seroderma pigmentosum, you get so many conditions starting with P, isn't it? Like photosensitivity, we get photophobia. And there may be some pigmentary changes, pigmentary changes and this is also going to be pre-malignant, isn't it, pre-malignant lesions. So all these P's are going to be coming under seroderma pigmentosum. 
Now, what is happening? Seroderma. If you divide it into two, serosis means dry skin. So, dry skin with pigmentation is called as seroderma pigmentosum, where the patient can have a severe photosensitivity and there may be some freckling and changes in the skin pigmentation. So, that is going to be seroderma pigmentosum. Yes, so this is going to be a mutation of nucleotide excision repair defect as well. So, that is going to be seroderma pigmentosum. Now, let's see the next one. A child presents with a sores in the mouth and a rash over the hands and feet as shown in the image. What is a causative organism? So, now there is a child who is having some sores within the mouth and also the patient is going to have some kind of a rash over the hand and the feet. So, from these things we know that what is involved here? The hand, the foot and the mouth. So, what is the name of the disease? So, here the diagnosis is going to be hand, foot, mouth disease. Isn't it? So, all of you are saying it the answer as Coxsackie virus A16. Excellent. The correct answer is going to be Coxsackie virus A16 which is a commonest causative organism when it comes to hand, foot, mouth disease. Now, in hand, foot, mouth disease, what is the primary skin lesion? Options are, is it a macule, is it a papule, is it a vesicle or is it a plaque? So, PK, Vishnu, all of you are answering it right. Now, can you tell me what is the primary skin lesion in hand, foot, mouth disease? In the primary skin lesion here is going to be a vesicle. It is going to be a vesicle. Okay, it's a fluid filled papule where the diameter is going to be less than 1 centimeter. Fine, that is going to be the typical primary skin lesion when it comes to hand, foot, mouth disease. When it comes to the causative organism, like all of you have rightly said that there is a Coxsackie virus A16. But do you know that there is one more causative organism when it comes to hand, foot, mouth disease. What is the one more causative organism that is already reported? or HFMD, hand, foot, mouth disease. So one more causative which is reported is going to be enterovirus EV71 subtype. Okay, EV71. So very good. So vesicular rash can be seen. So this enterovirus EV71 can be the causative in severe hand, foot, mouth disease with neurological symptoms with neurological symptoms fine so whenever there is some neurological symptoms that is associated with these vesicular eruptions that you see over the hand foot and mouth then the causative organism can be enterovirus ev71 which is going to be a severe type of a hand foot mouth disease fine so now let's move to the next one a child presents with fever and pleomorphic rash as shown in this image. What is the diagnosis of this condition? So options are chickenpox, smallpox, measles and rubella. So it is a child, the child had fever and the child had a pleomorphic rash. So pleomorphic rash is going to be your key term here. And the image is not very clear. Okay, you, can, you can make out that there may be some multiple papular or a vesicular lesion. Isn't it? So what is the right answer? Most of you are answering it as uh, chicken pox. That is option A. So you are absolutely right. What makes you answer it as chicken pox? What took you to the diagnosis here? So first thing is the important point that is pleomorphic. So why do you call it as a pleomorphic rash? Because you can see all stages of the rash. All stages of the rash can be seen at the same time. Isn't it? You can see all the stages of the rash at the same time. What do I mean with the all stages of the rash? Because sometimes the rash would have started like a change in color of the skin, a macule. And then a patient would have developed some papules. Then some of these lesions may have become a vesicle. 
and these some of these vesicles would have ruptured to form a erosion and this whatever has been ruptured would have been dried over the skin to form some crusting so all these can be seen at the patient in a patient at the same time hence we call it as a pleomorphic rash but what is the most typical primary skin lesion in chicken pox to make out a diagnosis are you looking for any macule are you looking for any papule or are we looking for a vesicle yes we are going to look for a vesicle very good so these vesicles now what is the peculiarity of these vesicles that you can see in chicken pox what is it usually compared to so the vesicles that you see in chicken pox this can be compared to who can answer in the chat box please it is usually compared with something it's so poetic what is it it can be compared to a dew drops on a rose petal